For someone recently released from incarceration, the quickest path back into custody is to reoffend. AB 109 has enabled hundreds to become eligible for early release from local detention centers. The problem is that many upon release see no options. They have no marketable skills, no place to live, no hope. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Beth Garrison, your host for this edition of Inside Kern, the program that seeks to demystify county programs, projects, and services. Today, we're going to take a look at AB 109, the California Assembly Bill that seeks to close the revolving door on lower level offenders cycling in and out of detention centers. The impact on county staff has been great, but Kern County Sheriff, Probation, and Mental Health have been working together like never before. On this first part of a two-part series, we're going to talk to Kern County Sheriff and see what they're doing. From Norris Road all the way to the Lairdo Detention Center, you're going to see that they're having an impact and making a difference. So, stay tuned for this edition of Inside Kern. In retirement, I thought my husband and I would enjoy going places together. Our son's drinking interfered with our plans. We worried about him and our grandchildren and didn't know where to go for help. We found help and support at Al-Anon family group meetings in hospitals, churches, and schools. Is someone's drinking troubling you? You might be surprised at what you can learn at an Al-Anon family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to al I didn't, I didn't take what they gave me the first time as a blessing. Uh, I mean, what, what, no, what I got was a blessing, uh, and I didn't take it as one. Yeah. Like literally, my charters, you know, loaded firearm in possession. Uh, a year county did 87 days on it. That's a lot of data, yeah. What? <laughs> no, no, they didn't take that as a blessing, so what happened, I go, you know, still. Yeah. Look at they, they threw me, got me the program, didn't stick around, came, you know, got blessed again. Two years and a half, got out, came back with a better mindset, came actually open-minded, you know what I mean, willing to learn, and then, you know, of course, I'm where I'm at today. Uh, One day at a time, made it here. When people who have been incarcerated want to turn their lives around, they're often met with slammed doors, closed windows, and few options. Kern County is working to change that, and the truth is, it starts while in custody. Instead of three squares and a bed, Kern County has educational opportunities, substance abuse, tattoo removal programs, and anger management programs, all designed to equip people to live successful lives on the outside. Kern County Sheriff Donna Youngblood is proud of the work his department has done and believes that departments and agencies are working together better than ever. Sheriff Youngblood, how are you today? How are you? I'm well, thanks, thanks. Can you come and talk with me? Absolutely. Sheriff, tell me about AB 109. Give me an overview when and why it came into play. Uh, inmates in the state prison system filed a lawsuit, Coleman v. Uh, v. Plata and they alleged that they didn't have proper health care, mental health care in the prison facilities. Okay. They won that lawsuit and a three judge panel then ordered the state of California to reduce the number of inmates that they had because the overcrowding was causing the lack of proper medical mental health care 
So the governor was given a number of inmates to, to be at at certain um, points, and uh, he's been trying to, to get there. And hence realignment came where those inmates, a lot of them were doing time in the county jails now as opposed to state prison. So what impact has it had on your department? Well, pre-realignment, an inmate could do one year in the county jail. With good work time, they're in and out six months at the most. Mm -hmm. And most of those were misdemeanors. Some of them were felonies, some were wobblers. But uh, now we get violent prisoners out of the state that would be doing time in the state prison system into our county jail. Some of them with lengthy uh, 14, 15 year sentences. LA County has a couple over 40 year sentences. Those type of inmates have to be dealt with completely differently. And you can't just mix and match inmates. You can't just have a big room and throw them all in there because you have prison gangs and you can't mix them together. So there's a lot of issues with, with uh, realignment. So how has your department adapted to the change in population? Well, for 30 years we have been releasing people, uh, fed capping them, letting them out early. At one point they, we were down to, you were doing 20% of your time in the county jail because of overcrowding. And so when this first happened, we had that severe overcrowding uh, problem and we know, our history tells us, we get the same inmates back over and over and over again. They, they, uh, we learned that kicked them out the front door with no money, no driver's license, uh, no change in their life, that we could expect the same result and they would be back. So, so we, we picked up on that pretty quickly. And then along came Prop 47 that made uh, virtually uh, everything a misdemeanor. So that gave us some empty bed space. We started some, some programs uh, the state did furnish us some money, and we have a, uh, a CCP the group of, of county uh, department heads, mental health, probation, uh, district attorney, public defender, uh, numerous people that are on this committee. That dis We distribute that amount of money uh, however we think we need to, uh, to uh, attack this problem. And part of it is the, the programs that we have inside the facilities. Uh, such as the RSAP, you know, residential uh, substance abuse program, anger management, uh, child care. Uh, we have people on electronic monitoring that we give them a chance to go out and we monitor their, their activities. So uh, what we've done is trying to give them uh, a way of changing their life if they choose to before they go back out. And a lot of times they will leave our custody and go into probation. It's not custody, but they'll, they'll kind of progress to pro, uh, probation and uh, give them an opportunity to, uh, to be successful. And we think that we are having some success. Uh, you know, we're not gonna change the world. Uh, we have people that have to be in custody because there are people out there that wanna hurt our, our citizens. And it's my job to uh, public safety. So, uh, it, but it has changed and really Kern County has led the way. We have some great employees at Laredo that have committed to these programs. And I've heard the inmates when they graduate talk about they don't wanna let the officers down. Well, that's, that's a pretty encouraging thing uh, to hear uh, when you see someone graduating from a program. So you've been with Kern County Sheriff for a long time. So is it a different way of working with inmates than it was, say, 20 years ago? Not even that far back, yes. Uh, if you go back 10 years, oh, what our job was is to go out and arrest a bad guy, put him in jail, keep them confined so they don't try to keep them hurting each other in custody and when they did their time kick them out on the streets and expect a different result <laughs> and we found that we weren't going to we weren't ever going to get a different result got it got it now um what is your greatest challenge with ab 109 and how are you addressing that challenge well realignment caused us a lot of challenges and, and the probably one of the biggest is the long-term sentenced inmate uh, you have to treat people that are in custody for 20 or 30 years differently uh, than you do someone that's going to be there for three to six months. And those inmates, uh, a lot of them have committed some pretty serious offenses. So uh, it's, it's, you have a lot more inmate on inmate assaults, you have a lot more inmate on staff assaults. So staff, have, they have to be protected as well from these, from these people. And it, it's, uh, it was a new way of, for us to do business, but it not only uh, takes uh, more officers, it takes more space because you can't just put them all together. And uh, it, it uh, really, there were some challenges there that, uh, that the staff, the sheriff's office really met head on and uh, have done a great job. Now, Lairdo, let's talk about Lairdo. There's a future that looks a little bit different for Lairdo in terms of facility. Tell me about that. Well, we have, uh, if you 
if you look back at the Coleman Plata lawsuit, it was about inmates not getting proper uh, medical and mental health care. So we're building a new facility at Laredo, 800 beds, uh, of which $100 million came from the state of California and under AB 900. But in that facility, we will have uh, over 100 mental and medical health beds. So we will have, a, a, if, if we just built another jail facility, we'd be in the same position the state's in. Those same attorneys are, are swooping around jails in California because the, the uh, same condition in their mind exists. So we're trying to do things differently. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we have mental health on, on, on board with us. We have medical from uh, KMC cooperating like they never have before. So we really, uh, we have high hopes that when the attorneys come to our jail, they're gonna say, that's what we're looking for. Awesome. Now, when, what is the timeline? June of 2017, they're, they're, okay. they're building it as we speak. And uh, it will, you know, we have a um, facility out there that was built a couple times because it burned down once, but it was built like houses and it's for minimum inmates and it literally is falling down. So uh, we're trying to, uh, to, to make Laredo uh, a real jail and because we don't, you know, jail shouldn't be uh, Taj Mahal's and, and comfortable, but you have to take care of, you know, you're, as a sheriff, you're constitu constitutionally charged with the care of those inmates. So, uh, and I take that, that charge very seriously. Now, what needs still need to be met? And if you had additional funding, where would you put it? Well, the price of oil obviously is killing us right now, and it has a direct impact on uh, our ability to do our job. Uh, the, uh, the sheriff's role isn't just law enforcement on the streets. There's so many different roles. We have a civil division that is mandated by the Constitution. We have jails that are mandated by the Constitution. Courts, bailiffs, those are mandated by the Constitution. Patrol is not. So when you start uh, moving these, these chess pieces around, uh, you can't, you're gonna make somebody unhappy. And, and when you, the more money you lose, the more pieces you have to move, the more people become unhappy. And so we're, right now, uh, financing, the budget is really uh, a big issue with us. And I suspect it's gonna be that way for the next couple, three years because of the price of oil. Now, if you had an opportunity to speak to the general public about AB 109 and how they feel safe in their homes or not safe in their homes, what would you say? Well, I, what I would say is this is not a cure-all. There's people on the streets that, that want to make you a victim. There's people on the streets that want to take your property and my property. Um, today we have about 400 empty beds at, at Laredo. We haven't had for years, but with Prop 47 making everything a, a misdemeanor, we've, we've come up with a lot of empty beds. That's the good news. The bad news is there's 400 people out there that I know of that ought to be in custody doing time for drug uh, crimes because people that are addicted to drugs steal your property and my property so that they can uh, fuel their drug habits. So there's good and there's bad, uh, but I, th I, th I think at the end of the day, we have to understand that uh, the public is their number one protector that they have to watch out for themselves. Chance of a police officer being there at the time that an event occurs, not likely. It happens, but not very likely. So uh, you just have to be uh, uh, vigilant in your own safety. Uh, you know, uh, don't depend on others. So in essence, we are your partner in public safety. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add? Any other comments on the impact of AB 109? The, the importance of it? Well, I, I think that, that the most interesting thing is uh, Kern is, a, the more, is the most conservative county in the state of California. Therefore, we should be the last in programs because we didn't believe in those programs. The truth of the matter is we're leading the state in those programs and successes. Last year when the governor gave a state of the state speech, he mentioned Kern County's programs specifically because he came here and saw what we were doing. So uh, I'm pretty proud of the staff out there uh, you know, they're, you're out, half of you is out trying to put somebody in jail and the other half is trying to get them out. So, you know, I'm conflicted sometimes. I understand. Thank you so very you're much. Uh, between here and then between, I'm part of a 12-step fellowship, you know what I mean? Between the both, of the both of these combined, you know, that's how I am today. You know, my breaking point was whenever I was in there and I got that, uh, whenever I hit Wasco, you know, I was able to get pictures. You know, I got a picture of my son, his first year at T-Ball. And then I kind of kicked myself for that one, you know what I mean? I was yeah. like, man. So what happened though, I get out, then I become his t-ball coach for his second year and got to be a part of his life and tried to live that living amends with him for the little, you know, the year I was gone. And 
He's loving it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not just him, you know, I'm loving it. I always tell people that I'm grateful for stress. A lot of people don't understand that. I'm grateful for the fact that I could stress on paying rent. I could stress on, you know, buying food. Because mm -hmm. like, like for most of our backgrounds, you know, we didn't have to worry about rent. We didn't have to worry about food. Didn't have to worry about soap. Didn't worry, have to worry about toothpaste. Didn't have to worry about clothes. Not a stress in the world, you know, so I'm grateful for the stress that I get to have in life today. I'm Kristen Price. And I'm Russell Judd. And we're teaming up to create a safe sleeping environment for babies. Did you know that the best way for babies to sleep is in their own crib on their backs? This lowers their risk of sudden, unexplained infant death, commonly called SUID. You can further reduce your baby's risk by room sharing without bed sharing and by removing quilts, pillows, and stuffed toys from their crib. To learn more about Kern Medical Safe Sleep Campaign, call 326-2606. Um, what brought me to BI was, okay, I got released from law school. I got assigned to a CERN PO. Well, when I went to visit him, he told me, hey, well, there's a program we got that gets you off probation in six months. I said, let me have that. <laughs> um, when I got here, I just came with, a, with just a bad attitude, negative, negative, negative. One thing I learned here, I learned a lot here, but one of the things that I took with me that I really just how to stay positive. I had learned how to get a pos keep a positive attitude. And my hat's off to the whole staff in BI because they receive so much negativity and they turn it into a positive thing. They turn every, I mean, to receive people like me the way I came in and for them to still t stay positive is like, wow. Like, why do you have to put up with my negativityness and still, you know, stay cheerful? Sheriff Donnie Youngblood has key people working on AB 109 programs, including Chief Deputy Shelley Castaneda and Detentions Lieutenant Ian Silva. They both believe the work they're doing is making a difference. Chief Deputy Shelley Castaneda manages detentions for Kern County. Now, over the past decade, she has seen a lot of changes. Let's talk to her about those changes. So, what is the difference the way deputies uh, interface with inmates today as opposed to 10 years ago? Well, you know, since I came out of the department in 1991, um, we've evolved quite a bit. Um, today, our detentions deputies are very hands-on. They're very much an integral part of the inmates' programming and their success from start to finish. Uh, we have deputies that are actually in the housing units interviewing inmates uh, for participation, um, monitoring them for success, for issues, for problems. And they're very much a part of them. And actually, they do facilitate some of our programs with the, the jail as well. Now, you talk about success. Is there a way that your deputies sort of earmark or see or perceive that some people are more open to successful recovery? You know, I, I think it's just, it's just spending time with the inmates and, you know, having conversations with them, finding out what their issues are, what their problems are, um, what the barriers are for them. And sometimes it's just a matter of, a, of one of our deputies making a connection with an inmate and planting that seed. And, you know, once they make that decision to, you know, Make, make a start and uh, participate in a program, then it's, it's up to that inmate, you know, whether or not they want to be a success. So let's talk about programs. It, what do you think is your most successful program or are some of your most successful programs? You know, we've got a lot of great programs and a lot of them have to do with um, job skills, GED, or we also have some for substance abuse. I would say probably our residential substance abuse treatment uh, program is probably one of our um, flagship programs um, and that's a great collaboration between uh, mental health staff and sheriff's office staff. It's a 12-week um, program that's facilitated in custody and the inmates actually uh, are housed together and they stay together and they uh, progress through the program you know together as, as a group um, and that has had a great success rate. It's an evidence-based program and it teaches them coping skills, how to avoid the substance abuse issues that have plagued them and landed many of them in jail. Um, and that's been very successful. At the completion of that program, the inmates um, are generally uh, 
uh, placed on one of our out-of-custody programs such as the uh, electronic monitoring program where they're further supervised and um, monitored and you know we've had great success and a lot of good success stories on inmates who've been gainfully employed and were able to stay sober and um, avoid all the things that got them into jail. Now you spoke of mental health. What are some of the other agencies that you work with or you partner with? We partner with a lot of different agencies. The mental health department is one, um, probation department is another. We also have some community-based organizations that we work with. Um, Bakersfield Adult School facilitates our GED program. So we have a lot of great partners um, that, that work hard and um, facilitate a lot of great programs for, for the inmates. From your perspective, what are some of the tools that an individual needs in order to be successful on the outside? You know, that varies. Um, you know, we have male and female inmates. Sometimes the needs for the female inmates might be different than for the males. Um, but we're finding that sometimes it's just the basics that the inmates need. Uh, you know, resource-wise, when they are released from custody, they need the basics like, you know, how to fill out a job application or having a, a valid ID or driver's license so that they can apply for jobs or cash a check. Um, so we try to provide them a lot with the basics, um, the basic tools that they're going to need when they're on the outside. Graduates of our program, our RSEC program, we release them with a backpack full of, you know, underwear, t-shirts, and some basic toiletry items that a lot of the inmates that maybe are homeless may not have or be able to afford. So, you know, just the basics gives them a good start and has, you know, allows them to leave jail uh, feeling positive and good about themselves. So Chief, I know there are challenges because there are always challenges. Tell me what some of those significant ones are and how you are adjusting. Well, I'd say probably one of our biggest challenges is that we're dealing with a very different uh, type of inmate today than we were, you know, five or ten years ago. Um, today we have inmates that formerly were in the state prison system. Now we're managing them at the county level. And the problem is they tend to be more problematic in terms of um, operations and, and supervision-wise. You know, we have over 50 percent are gang-affiliated. We have uh, over 70 percent are mentally ill or receiving some sort of mental, mental, uh, mental health services. Um, we're not equipped, we're ill-equipped to, to deal with that type of long-term inmate, so um, we're having to make adjustments in that area, and, and one of the ways that we're addressing that is we're actually in the midst of building a new jail uh, via the AB 900 state grant that we were awarded, uh, Kern County was awarded, um, and that basically gave us $100 million to build a new facility. So this facility will be state-of-the-art, and it will address very specific issues that we have operationally, be a very secure facility, uh, a safe facility for the inmates and for the employees, but also it's going to better meet the me medical needs and the mental health needs of our inmates. So that's a real big thing. The other big feature of the new jail is it's going to open up um, a lot more areas for programming, which is, you know, the key to our philosophy now is uh, providing the inmate programs. That's what AB 109 uh, is all about. So um, we'll be able to really meet, better meet the needs a holist on a holistic level of you know, everything that the inmate needs to be successful and hopefully to prevent them from coming back into custody. You talk a lot about success. Have you seen or been able to quantify a reduction in recidivism? I mean, are less people on that rotating door coming back to Lerdo, coming back to Lerdo, coming back? You know, all of our programs are evidence-based, and we do have some uh, academic partners that are assisting us with data collection. Um, so far, we have done some studies on, on the programs and our success rates, and we are seeing some very good results, so we do believe we're on the right track as far as preventing uh, recidivism. Gaps. Are there gaps that remain? And if you had additional money, where would you put it? Well, as far as gaps, I, I would say, again, that probably it's just uh, the ongoing issue of staffing, you know, we have a number of retirements occurring and we're continually trying to get positions hired. We're kind of out of programming space, so the new jail will uh, facilitate that where we'll have a lot more room um, to, to facilitate the programs that are so needed. Um, the other thing is, just like I mentioned, we have a continual staffing issue, trying to get new deputies hired uh, to work in detentions has been a struggle and along with you know the, the state of the budget the way it is it's um, it's going to continue to be a challenge for us so um, we have very motivated staff I, I'm very proud of our staff because they've, they've completely bought into 
um, the programming that we're doing with the AB 109 clients and you know that started with the top with the sheriff you know he very much believes in the program that we're doing and, and the good that we're doing for the community members so that my staff really has taken it to heart and they've really just got in and you know um, immerse themselves in in you know all they can do to be a part of the of the uh, answer to the problem. So would you say that that is your department's strength? Is there is there let's let's make this happen and let's do it? I think they have many strengths, but I would say probably one that really stands out in my mind is that they're incredibly dedicated, um, incredibly incredibly resourceful. Um, I give them a task or a challenge and it's met and it's always with the goal of you know helping our inmates to be better citizens to be productive and be successful out on the inside and to prevent them from coming to jail to begin with so I would say just the collaboration that I've seen the teamwork that I've seen all of those are strengths in my opinion of the, of the detentions uh, personnel that I have tell me about the future what do you see if you had a crystal ball what do you see in there well I I see that my staff's going to continue to do good work. We're going to continue to see good results um, with our with our inmate population. I think our programming, um, our programs that we're facilitating are only going to grow and uh, get better. So I, I see good things. It's just uh, right now we're just dealing, like I said, with the budget issues, and um, so that kind of presents a challenge for us. John Q. Public hears about AB 109, an early release of inmates. It sometimes makes them fearful. If you had an opportunity to speak to that, what would you say? Well, I would see, say that there's a lot of collaboration going on at the county level between all the stakeholders to ensure that we are equipping um, our former inmates to be productive citizens. Um, we're trying to address anything that might present an obstacle uh, for people when once they're released from custody. So I would say, you know, it's they're part of our they're a part of our community. You know, these folks that are getting out of um, jails, these are ones that formerly were in the state prison system, and now we have them here in the county. So I would say that they're they're well monitored, they're well supervised, and we are trying to provide all the tools and resources to make a person successful. Now, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So, you know, there's gotta be some self-accountability on the part of the inmates. Um, you know, there's really no excuse for somebody not to succeed with the things that we're able to provide them now in the cust in custody setting. And that's, that's the exciting part and the benefit of AB 109, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. Final thoughts. I think when we all started this in 2011, you know, when AB 109 went into effect, it was a huge undertaking and I think there was a lot of concern about whether or not we would be successful, but I, I'm proud to say now, I've seen with my own eyes the, the difference we're making in lives uh, of our the inmates that, that come through our custody. I've seen the buy-in of the deputies that are working with, with the inmate population and the programming aspect of it. So um, just very proud of where we've, you know, all that we've accomplished and how we've evolved to um, a very uh, productive partner in ensuring the success of, of many people that are returning to the community. So while there are costs to AB 109, to staffing and resources, there are benefits to the community overall. Absolutely, because you know if we're able to you know release an inmate out to uh, EMP, for example, they can still have contact with their families, they can still be a father or a mom, or they can still hold down a job and be a productive member of society while, you know, still in our custody and uh, under our supervision. So um, we're just able to accomplish a lot with our virtual jail section and, and the things that allow us to supervise on the outside of the jail walls. So that's, that's been very important. Okay, keep up the good work. Thank you. From the start, I always had doubts in the area to see me anybody. But since I've entered the major program, I've totally seen a hundred percent different change in my life, my attitude, my beliefs, and my addiction. I mean, I've picked up some new tools and so much other behavioral experiences. It's wonderful. 
what has made the biggest difference in your life? Personally, if you, if you just look at yourself, what, has, what was the biggest trigger to change? Honesty with myself. I had to be more open toward myself and actually say, you know what, it's time to change. Because there's, it's, it's been a roller coaster of always gotten hope from that. I never even actually wanted a program until I, I have so many letdowns in my life. I can't blame nobody but myself. So these programs actually opened my eyes up so I'd be honest with myself if I can be honest with anybody else. Now tell me about the deputies here. Um, do you have a good relationship? Is it antagonistic? What is it? It's a, it's a really good relationship. As far as, as we can go as being a deputy and inmate, I know Ms. Knox, she has a big heart. She cares. The sponsors cares. They all care about us. They want us to succeed. Some officers think that okay, well maybe he'll be back. I mean, we just let that go. I mean, that's, and it's, that's just their ways. I mean, there's a lot of officers that want to see me succeed. They have very many different happy academics here. Like auto body, there's officers in auto body that are doing a good job. You know, I have to see you doing good. If um, you had an opportunity to tell the general public, because you do, you're on TV right now, um, what would you say that you, how do you want them to look at you when you are released? As a change man, I want all my past, my past better go in the past. I'm a new start. I got new tools, new um, goals I'm looking for. There's go with the old me, like the new me. Don't always be judged by my past. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. That was wonderful. Thank you. So we're here at the Lairdo Detention Facility and joining me is Lieutenant Ian Silva. He is the detentions lieutenant and he's over all of the programs that they offer here and many of them through AB 109. So tell me some of the programs that you're doing here at Lairdo. We have a wide variety of programs meant to address a variety of needs that inmates have in order to be successful once they leave custody. We have vocational programs such as uh, kitchen work, um, GED, or GED testing for, pro, uh, for educational purposes. Um, we also have treatment programs to help inmates uh, deal with substance abuse issues, anger replacement therapies. So we have a wide variety of, it, of uh, programs because inmates are very diverse in what they need to be successful. In your opinion, what has been the most successful program that you offer? We're proud of all of our programs. One of our flagship programs, though, is our Residential Substance Abuse Treatment Program. This is a program where a group of inmates actually are housed together for about a 90-day period, and they go to treatment together, receive services together. And what that's allowed us to allow them to do is they support one another in their recovery efforts. It's kind of almost a team mentality, if you will. And then once they complete that, they can be released on our electronic monitoring program and we track them once they're out, out of custody to see what kind of success rate we get. And that program in particular has been very successful. We've got a lot of success stories of inmates actually turning their lives around and being successful once they leave the jail. Now, I understand you do offer a GED program. How do you do that? Well, we partner with Bakersfield Adult School. And they actually have staff here on site that teach classes. They, they do the readiness portion where they get an inmate ready to take the GED test. And then once an inmate's ready, we actually do the test right here on site uh, via computers. And we've been able to graduate a number of inmates. People who came in here with little or no education actually can leave here with a GED in hand. And that obviously makes them much more likely to be successful, get a job once they leave custody. Now, one of the most visible programs is, of course, litter pickup on the side of the road. Is, is that something people want to do? Yes, we actually, you'd be surprised, but sometimes it is one of those programs that's kind of coveted. Inmates want to be a part of that program. They feel like they're out doing something constructive. They, they get out of the jail. They're, they're closely supervised. It's a secure, secure situation, but um, they've been very successful in that they've, we, they've picked up just this last, since this fiscal year began, over 500,000 pounds of trash. So we're not only giving the inmates a program to be involved in, but we're also helping beautify the community. And it really does make a visible difference. Now tell me about this monitor behind us. What is going on 
on, on all of these different classrooms. Well, this is a station from which we monitor class, classes that are in progress. These are actual inmates taking classes from mental health staff or Bakersfield Adult School staff, be they educational or whatnot. Usually you'll see yeah. the bulk of these classrooms filled up. We happen to just have a couple going right now. We monitor it from here, and this is where our, this is the the nexus of our programs. This is where the bulk of our programs actually happens in these classrooms that we're monitoring from the station. What tools do you think are necessary for someone who has been incarcerated to be successful on the outside? Well, what's what's really important to understand is there's a, there's a very diverse uh, spread of needs that an inmate might have. Some need educational help, some need vocational help, some need some kind of substance abuse tra treatment or anger management, parenting classes. It's a wide net, and every inmate has a particular mix of needs they they that that will make them get where they need to be. One of the things we do is we use a nationally validated set of assessment tools so we can refine what an individual inmate need, needs and try to pair them with the services that will get that done for them. Is there a need missing if you had more money to develop new programs? Is there something that comes to mind? Well, we're working towards uh, connecting inmates with employers more. We're working towards trying to uh, create situations where they can get driver's license, not not take tests, but if they don't, if they've lost their driver's license for some reason, to get that reinstated or a California ID. We're even looking towards things like social security cards, so that we can give some of those tools to the inmate when they leave through the normal processes. Those are things we're developing, or, or at least uh, determining how feasible it's going to be to be able to do this, to meet those needs. Final thoughts. Um, I think what, what you're seeing here is a, a very different mentality. Um, now we, nowadays we have deputies who are actually involved in, and civilian program staff that are involved in helping the inmates get ready for when they get released to be successful. It's a very different uh, uh, mindset from the time when, when our job was basically to keep them secure, to keep them safe as long as they were meant to be here and not do much beyond that apart from meet those basic needs. So it's it's kind of a different mindset to see inmates who are talking with deputies and, and connecting with, with deputies who are interested in getting them out of jail on the right foot so they don't come back. Perfect, thank you so much. No. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. During reintegration, you go through the honeymoon stage, you come home and everything is great at first. When I came back, my wife and children were great and all of a sudden, my wife goes to work, kids go to school, I'm by myself and all I'm doing is thinking about my 43 soldiers. The room could be filled with people that I loved and cared about and I'd be over here thinking about what happened in Iraq three months ago. You're almost like a stranger when you come back. Everything's different, you're kind of discombobulated. People were asking me how it was, but I got the sense they couldn't relate to what I had been through, so I just stopped talking about it. It made a tremendous difference in my life when I chose to get help. In hindsight, it probably saved my life, it saved my marriage. I personally believe that I'm also a better soldier. Sometimes when you come home, it can seem negative, distressing, and concerning. It can all be got through and will be got through. You're not going to be the same person afterwards that you were before you deployed. And don't try to be. Accept who you are and now figure out how to move forward and make that positive. You know, while I was in prison, uh, I had made the choice already. Like, I, I, I was tired of being high. I was tired of, 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 of being in prison. So when I came here, it was, it was opportunity. It was opportunity. And I seen that. And I took it. You know, it, it, it wasn't easy. It, it wasn't easy. And, and, and here is where I learned uh, 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 my life skills, you know, uh, how, how to uh, uh, deal with everyday situations without going back to my old ways, without dealing with, with situations of, you know what, forget this, or I'm going to give up, I'm going to go get high and just not care about anything. And, and, and here is where I learned to, to, to cope with things. In, in, a, in, in a sense of, of the way we should be coping with them, you know? So as you can see, Kern County Sheriff has had their hands full, and I'm proud to say they have stepped up to the challenge. Their efforts are making a difference.
Thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside Kern. Be sure to stay tuned for the second part of this series as we focus on the impact of AB 109. We'll be talking to Kern County Probation, Mental Health, and get the final word from Supervisor Leticia Perez. Copy, 10 Two, Sandra, one. 